Hi, I just want to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to the latest YLL virtual event. And hopefully we have enough people that, have, that are online and I'm sure more people will join as they sign on. And this is a part of uh, one of a series of events YLL been doing on Zoom during lockdown. And I'm Megan and I'll be chairing the event this evening. I'm one of the YLL committee members and I'm part of the parliamentary engagement team. So we have a fantastic cross-party panel here this evening to talk about current legal aid and access to justice issues. So we have Carl Turner MP, who's the Labour Shadow Minister for Legal Aid. We have Baroness Natalie Bennett, who's the Green Party Life Peer and a Vice Chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Legal Aid. And Natalie's just on another committee meeting at the minute and she's going to join us shortly, so that's why you can't see her yet. Uh, we also have Daisy Cooper, MP, who's the Justice Spokesperson for the Liberal Democrats and also a Vice Chair of the APPG on Legal Aid. Lives Savile Roberts, MP, who's the Justice Spokesperson for Plaid Cymru. And James Daly, MP, another Vice Chair of the APPG on Legal Aid. So our panellists are each going to explain briefly their experience of working on legal aid issues and then the rest of the event will be an opportunity for people from the audience to ask questions. So if you just see at the bottom of your screens, there's a Q&A function. So you can ask questions to the panel members and you can ask questions specifically to one panel member or you can ask to the panel as a whole and I'll read out the questions that are put to the panel as a whole and any individual ones the panel members can read out and answer. So I think we're going to make a start and if Carl Turner MP, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off and explaining what your involvement with legal aid has been. Thank you very much indeed, Megan, and thanks uh, to you and young legal aid lawyers for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, this evening. And thanks to One Pump Court for facilitating this as well. But my interest in legal aid stems from practicing as a criminal lawyer. I practiced initially as a criminal solicitor and then uh, as a barrister from my local chambers. And look, I've always been absolutely upfront about what the Labour Party's position has been historically. I'm bound to say, because it's the truth, that it wasn't perfect under the last Labour government, to be honest. And my own experience as a practitioner, you know, told me that things weren't right. But actually, things going back to when I was practicing as a legal aid lawyer uh, were an awful lot better then than they are now. Uh, the stats speak for themselves. In, I think, 1997 to 2010, the average yearly uh, spend on legal aid expenditure was £2.56 billion pounds in real terms. Compare that with... Uh, recent events since 2010 to 2019, the average yearly legal aid spend is 1.96 billion. It's massively uh, less than what it was in those years under a Labour government. Legal aid expenditure today is 34% lower than in 2010. It's much uh, worse to be a legal aid lawyer under this Tory government than it was under the previous uh, previous Labour government, there's absolutely no doubt whatsoever about that. And if you just look at crime, which was the area that I practised in, in 2010, there was 1,861 criminal firms in England and Wales. In 2019, there was 1,271. Now, there's 1,147 criminal firms of practitioners in uh, England and Wales. And, you know, I have to say, this government have been pretty awful, actually, in uh, providing access to justice. But the worst piece of legislation in the history, I think, of 
access to justice or indeed preventing access to justice would have to be the legal aid sentencing and punishment of uh, offences act it took huge swathes of law from the scope of legal aid including clinical negligence uh, most of immigration housing debt and employment and the post implementation review uh, of 2017 2018 found that the removal of legal aid at early stages of proceedings resulted in a bigger spend overall so it didn't actually even save money it was just a deliberate and cynical vicious ploy to attack access to justice by indeed i have to say it at the worst the worst ever lord chancellor uh, chris grayling in the history of the office of Lord Chancellor. No wonder he won himself the title failing grailing. He really was a disaster. The government was sued in public law. Judicial, there was more judicial reviews when failing grailing was at the helm of the justice system than under any other previous justice secretary we've ever known. And there are some really serious problems in relation to the current crisis of COVID as well. You look at the recent Bar Council survey in 2020, which found that BAME lawyers are the most affected. The government are doing absolutely nothing about that. 55% of BAME barristers earn more than half of their income from legal aid. And a staggering 69% of those earning uh, are earning half or more than half of their income from publicly funded work. There are now massive areas of law where you simply cannot get access to justice. And the Labour Party's view, and it has been for an awful long time, is that the uh, access to justice, legal aid, should be treated as the National Health Service, actually, of the justice system and that's what we'd do if we managed to persuade the country to elect a Labour government. Thanks very much indeed for the opportunity to speak this evening. Great, thank you very much. So I think we're going to go to Baroness Natalie Bennett next. Well, thank you very much and um, thank you for the patience of my jumping from the Agriculture Bill to a very different subject. And where I start very much with this is a phrase that I guess I um, uh, developed oh, best part of a decade ago now, and that is that justice unfunded is justice denied. And you know, the reason why I developed that probably around about 2012 is because that was when we started to see legal aid just being slashed and slashed and slashed again. Um, and I can think of standing and, uh, outside uh, Westminster in front of a huge crowd all crowded up together, something that seems very strange now, um, with lots of uh, walking up and down a platform with lots of people with QC after their name. Um, and I think one of the things we've seen is the focus on this has, has sometimes been sort of led by people who are seen as at the top of the profession. But I think it's really important that we get the, the younger voices coming through because one of the things we're seeing is, of course, very much the ageing of the legal aid workforce and the real extreme difficulty of people who really want to do this work, really care about it, really passionate about it. But as to some of the work you've done as the Young Lawyers Association um, acknowledges, it's getting to be very like, you know, my background is in journalism. It's these very few people in journalism now who don't come from a comfortable financial family background. Um, if we look at the arts and culture, there's very few people from those who, who don't come from that kind of background who make it in the arts because you can end up having to work for so long with so little money, with so much insecurity, that it's just not possible. And that, of course, is a huge issue in terms of making sure that there's a diverse legal profession, a diverse uh, group of people providing the aid that really is able to represent the clients and, and, and understand the experiences of the clients. I was kind of thinking that maybe I should begin by sort of making a declaration of interest as one does in these parliamentary things, because you know, um, many people will probably be aware that Greens do get involved in lots of protests and Greens get arrested quite often. So you know, the whole issue of legal aid for people engaged in non-violent direct action, you know, from frackers, from anti-HS2 people, all of those are areas where you know, very often, indeed, I'm speaking to you from Sheffield, 
um, where some young lawyers working pro bono were absolutely crucial to the eventually successful fight to stop the felling of Sheffield street trees. Um, and people need to be able to support themselves to be able to do that extra kind of stuff that simply can't be paid for and is never going to be paid for. I think if I focus on one area of particular interest of mine, it is very much asylum law and the treatment of asylum seekers and refugees. And you know, Windrush is the most hideous example, but it's only just one example of so much horrendous things going on. And I'm actually working a lot at the moment with a um, site of asylum seeker housing called um, Urban House in Wakefield. I was up there at the weekend speaking to the people there under terrible conditions. And I've got a meeting with the government next week about this. And I think you know, this is particularly an issue for, for particularly concerned to like young lawyers because people are being held in horrendous conditions. They are your clients or should be your clients um, if there was the legal aid funding. Um, but it's also in the current context, the huge COVID risk. Um, it's a huge risk of people living incredibly overcrowded um, conditions. I was talking to sort of you know, middle-aged couples who live in a tiny room that has a bunk bed two beds stacked on top of each other, and you can just about walk past them. And they're sharing the bathrooms with dozens and dozens of other people, mostly young men. Um, and you know, that's the situation your clients are in. And I think it's also just because the figures came out uh, today, it's worth highlighting the situation in prisons. And this is something I've been speaking up a lot about, um, is you know, we've seen figures out again today, 490 prisoners in 80 prisons testing positive for COVID. 956 staff in 105 prisons. And many people working in legal aid are going to have to have contact uh, with people who are at risk. And that's a real risk for public health, a risk for all of us. Uh, and that's, of course, without getting onto immigration detention centres, which are supposed to be to hold people just before um, you know, they're, uh, they are removed from the country. Um, that's not going to happen anymore. So what is the justification for immigration detention now? There is none. And yet the government has simply just been you know, dead batting away any comments on that. And something else, and I'd be interested if anyone perhaps can make any contribution on this, is I've been thinking a bit about what's happening in the probation service. You know, so hit, uh, uh, Carl mentioned, you know, the terrible Chris Grayling, and you know, one of his worst things was the, the privatisation of the probation service. And you know, they're now starting to try and undo that damage, but what's happening to probation under these, these current circumstances? Um, you know, we really have heard very little about it, yet it's got to be an area of grave concern. And that, again, you know, is, is a public health issue. It's, a, it's an issue for all of us in terms, of, in terms of society and looking after people and helping people rehabilitate. And I talked about prisons. And of course, you know, what we have now is extreme lockdown in most prisons. And we've had some very good debates in the Lords with lots of Lords saying, you know, what's happened to rehabilitation in prisons? And it's clearly absolutely stopped. And you know, people that many young lawyers will know who they've tried to help, um, who've still ended up in prison, um, you know, are being treated absolutely disgracefully, including young people under 18s um, in youth detention being locked up you know, 23 hours a day. So I think there's a huge amount to worry about in the justice system. Legal aid is a big part of that. We've got to have change. You know, the system everyone is saying is right at breaking point and COVID is really, as in many areas, pushed things over the edge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. I'm going to go to Daisy Hooper MP next. Thank you, Megan. Um, I was really pleased to hear Carl say that legal aid is the, uh, sort of it should be the NHS of the justice system. That's something I said at the last Young Legal Aid Lawyers event uh, that was held in the Parliament, uh, Commonwealth Parliamentary Association uh, room in Parliament. And I think um, all of us who believe that should be repeating it time and time again uh, until the message gets through. Um, I think uh, when I was asked to speak this evening, I think part of the brief was to talk about um, legal aid and how it's, uh, and what the impact has been during COVID. Um, now, I'm not sure how many of your um, sort of participants will, will know, but as an MP, my case workload has completely changed. It completely changed overnight. So normally we would have lots of welfare cases, we would have lots of housing cases, and we would have lots of immigration cases. And because local councils stopped moving people around, everyone stayed in their homes, uh, and because a lot of the uh, immigration system ground to a halt, the casework changed overnight. Um, we had lots of other casework to do with people stranded abroad, lots of individual businesses, you know, desperate to get grants, trying to fix holes in the government's um, uh, packages of support and things like that. So I think the honest answer is, 
that I haven't had very much casework at all that's related to legal aid but I think there's going to be a torrent coming down the track <laughs> and I think that's the thing that we all need to be aware of so I think um, somewhere down the line we should probably have a similar kind of event where we see where we're at in a few months time but I think we're literally just on the cusp of seeing some of these some of these cases come back with a vengeance um, as restrictions start to ease but that's an honest assessment of where certainly where my casework has been for the last few weeks and um, that said because a lot of my casework has been around individuals and businesses, what has become apparent is that there is a complete meltdown in the justice system amongst the workforce in terms of the fragility of legal aid suppliers and the supplier base. We know already that for a long time, a lot of legal aid, a lot of legal aid lawyers have been operating on very low profit margins. And when there's been a great deal of preparation work, um, often it can mean that they're earning less than minimum wage on some particular cases. So we know there's a bit of fragility there anyway, um, but we know this has been made a lot worse as it has been for lots of, you know, for everybody um, who's been impacted professionally uh, through COVID. So on the uh, 14th of May, um, I and my Liberal Democrat colleagues wrote to the government asking them um, to support proposals that came from the Bar Council, which was about providing an urgent rescue package for those at the publicly funded bar um, and an urgent rescue package for chambers doing publicly funded work as well. Uh, we haven't had a response to that letter yet, um, but certainly something that we can something that we can can chase up so that we know there's a real issue here. Related to this is we also know there's a crisis in the courts. <laughs> now, I haven't seen any figures yet, but I'm hearing anecdotal evidence from different parts of the country that there are some parts of the country that reckon they might it might take them a year to have to clear the backlog of the cases that they've got. Now, that isn't, that's not based on the assumption that you've still got the same number of uh, legal aid lawyers available to do that kind of work. Um, it also, you know, also raises the question about what will happen if they can't use courts because you can't apply the social distancing rules. So there are big questions about you know, finding other suitable spaces instead of the existing courts. There are big questions about whether some cases might have to go being judge decided only cases rather than having um, a full jury and the implications for that for the legal aid lawyers and for their funding. So there's some really big question marks over this. And certainly I've had um, various um, uh, legal practitioners in touch with me um, ab about some of these issues. So I think what's really important, um, and I'm sure you'll take this on board as a campaign organisation, there is a widespread belief that lawyers are generally rich, and they're pretty loaded and they do all right, and that um, and they can probably survive um, and they've got more you know, financial resilience than many other people uh, in society. That is obviously true for some lawyers, but I think it's a real challenge to young legal aid lawyers and other campaign groups to make the point that that is not the case for all lawyers across the board. And what we really need, I think, is a package of support, ideally from the government, that focuses specifically on these legal aid practitioners and the viability of the legal aid sector as a whole because if people start to leave the sector then you know it doesn't matter how much money you throw at legal aid if you haven't got people there to actually you've got the workforce to do the legal aid work so those for me are the key priorities and um, just because Natalie mentioned it I will say that um, I have added my support to uh, your early day motion which is um, trying to prevent the new fees for the asylum and immigration appeals so well done to you for for getting that up and running. It was very, very happy to sign it. I'll probably finish on that note. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your support on the early day motion. And Liz, I think we'll go over to you now. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I, in many ways, I inherited being the spokesperson for justice for Plaid Cymru because there are, you know, there's not many Plaid Cymru MPs. And my predecessor was a barrister, Alvin Floyd, and they just rather assumed that because I also represented Duvo Merionid that somehow or other this would be like osmosis and that I would be able to take on. But the, the advantage of having no legal background whatsoever is actually you can ask the stupid questions because you haven't actually got to worry about whether you're making a fool of yourself. Just to take a step back, my experience and what Daisy was talking about with the increase in case loading, I think you'll find that you know, case load that every MP will, will refer to that and the sort of um, the sort of cases that we're getting coming through now. But um, in, I represent a very rural constituency in Northwest Wales, it's over 800 square miles. This is a constituency that previously had five magistrates courts and now has no magistrates court whatsoever. No, this is not an uncommon experience. 
but nonetheless that some people within the police force area may well be required to travel 60 and more miles to get to the nearest the nearest magistrate court within the police force area and you know we will we, we'll discuss this within um, access to justice um, debates here but I mean just to put the the, the, the simple almost the overly simplistic point but the one thing that, that that guides me is that sense that only the state can provide justice to all citizens and society it isn't available to everybody else otherwise it isn't available equally it is it, it depends on people's access to money otherwise and the underpinning structure of, of, of that which keeps state civilized and a society civilized only the state can provide that with justice we may have to make reasonable um, considerations to how much we can afford but the fundamental either it provides or it doesn't and i think you know the experience of coming in and much of what we've talked about now um, is relating to frankly the, the the failure to provide that and the failure to step up to the mark so that is the duty of the state because if it doesn't the state doesn't do it it doesn't happen now what i'll just touch upon because um it probably won't come up from anybody else is the anomaly of course that we have in wales of having a legislature but no legal jurisdiction and now that the legislature has existed and gradually become further empowered since its um inauguration in 1999 so just over 20 years um what you've seen is a gradual growth in legislation that is produced in wales in the senate what used to be called the assembly and how that sits alongside that which is being produced in Westminster. Um, there is a particularly interesting um, inquiry that was published, the report for which was published back in October last year. The Commission for Justice in Wales, which was ch chaired by Lord Chief Justice, former Lord Chief Justice um, John Thomas. And interestingly, they actually make a recommendation in that, that the funding for legal aid and for the third sector providing advice and assistance should be brought together in Wales to form a single fund under direction of an independent body, just to see, you know, to, to, to deal specifically with, with the Welsh, Welsh case. Um, we've touched upon Chris Grayling and probations earlier on. I think we expect a statement possibly on probation tomorrow. Um, again, interestingly, when the changes were beginning to be announced, I mean, frankly, the, the community rehabilitation companies were beginning to fray away at the edges. Um, the MOJ decided that Wales would be brought, the, the CRC provision would be brought back in under public control in Wales earlier than England because so many of the associated services, and you're talking about health, health and ho housing primarily, but education as well, were devolved, that it made more sense to bring them all back under public control in Wales earlier on. I mean, we shall see, I think probably this is going to be accelerated again in the announcement tomorrow, we, we, we shall hear. Um, right, the other thing that I particularly like to raise is that I am presently on the Bill Committee for the Domestic Abuse Bill, and I know that somebody has raised questions about legal aid and special measures and cross-examination. I think this will probably come up tomorrow because it is, in fact, this is a, this is a change that's occurred in the Domestic Abuse Bill between this year's version and last autumn, you know, the October 2019 version, is that cross-examination of witnesses in the family court, um, in instances where you've had previously um, uh, abuse, is, 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 to be, is, is not to be allowed along the same lines as, as criminal court. But nonetheless, I think what I've been campaigning on this in the past, that this should do, it, that it, I'm glad that this is beginning, beginning to come into the family court. I think the um, areas in which it will be permitted or the, the requirements by which you qualify for it should be broader than they presently are. And the, 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 the glaringly obvious weak point is it's not including the civil courts as well. Because we do know how um, perpetrators, as previous purposes, have, have used effectively abuse of process within the civil court as well. So there are steps in, in the right direction and I'm sure that there'll be further amendments on that when it comes to the Lords. Um, just to close my, again, part of this sort of panic of landing here and having no legal background, but I, I was offered the opportunity to chair the um, cross-party group on, on justice unions. And again, that's a very interesting lens into the, you know, the, the cutting edge experience of what the cuts have meant in actually implementing courts to 
to PCS. Again, actually the experience of the Private Prison Officers Association and, and the educationalists and the health providers in prisons, it takes what you get presented by the government, it gives you a, a completely different take on it. So that that has been a real a real eye-opener. And I think it is it, it's quite um, extraordinary really. I mean to look at how the numbers in prison in England and Wales have not gone down. If you actually follow them from week to week, the numbers are still up there in the 83,000 and something. Uh, very few were actually released. I mean, probably you could count them on the fingers of, well, a number of hands, I won't quote the hands, um, but very few have been released in Wales. And again, of course, the other shocking thing, particularly considering the last week, last weekend events, is the, the, the proportion of people class from an age who are in our, in our prisons. And I think when we are looking for change, that should be one of the markers that we should see. Sorry, I, don't think that you need to, sorry I think you need to come a little tiny bit closer to your computer. I think you just dropped off at the end of what you just said there. Right, I, I was just talking about the need for change following this weekend's Black, or Black Lives Matter protests. And one of the indicators should be the, the, the percentage of people from a black and minority ethnic background who are in our prisons. When that goes down, that percentage, a whole number of the prison population should go down. But that will be one of the marks of success. Thank you very much, Liz. And finally, uh, Jim Steely, MP. Thank you very much, Megan. And I hope you can hear me. Um, I was a criminal legal aid defence solicitor for 16 years before coming into the house in uh, six months ago now. And there, the, I'm a member of the Justice Select Committee and I am passionate about many aspects to do with legal aid. But the first thing I'd like to talk about is the sustainability of a career in legal aid. And I can talk from my personal experience of criminal legal aid for young lawyers coming in. As other panelists have said, the remuneration for young criminal lawyers in particular is negligent is probably the correct word of saying it, that I would not, exp I, I don't mean to be, I'm so, <laughs> can I apologize for being negative to anybody who's listening here, but I'll just tell you what the experience is, that if you are a criminal legal aid lawyer in a town like Berry, where I'm from, you are unlikely to be earning as a basic salary, or certainly above 30,000, but between 25 and 30,000 pounds if you are lucky. There is no private pension scheme and to, I, I, I suppose you go into the job with your eyes open, but to, to create a sustainable income where you can pay your bills, you have to go to the police station on a regular basis and hope that your employer gives you a high percentage of the, of the call out. As other panelists have said, the, the decline in legal aid providers is extremely worrying. There are parts of the country where legal aid provision is basically non-existent and there are other parts of the country if you look at northumberland devon cornwall these areas where providers tend to be of a certain age who've been doing the job for a long time there are the new younger lawyers are not coming through um, and if you had to work for a, a law firm that you have to travel what 40 50 miles to go to your local court uh, and your wage and your salary is, is, is relatively low to start off with it is not a sustainable career at this moment in time. Now, in respect of criminal legal aid, I think there's a number of things that need to change. Uh, and one, as a criminal legal, and I must, I'm a member of Justice Select Committee, I must declare that I'm a, also a, mem a, a partner of firm of solicitors at this moment in time. So I, I continue to have experience of this. But a profession in legal aid, we, we could talk about any amount of money to put into the legal aid budget and any increase is clearly welcome. But there are things within the system which need to change. And also, I, I want to make the point that in my experience, the experience of solicitors compared to barristers is very different. We're all one legal profession, but Parliament has traditionally been stuffed with barristers. I'm glad that I found Cole because I suspect that me and Cole are probably the only people in the House of Commons, although there's very few of us with a criminal legal aid background, and there's very few criminal, yeah, I suspect, legal aid solicitors. The role of the legal aid solicitor, I don't think, has been represented in a in a in the best possible way, and I think we need to fight back. I think that th things that affect criminal legal aid firms are the flow of work, 
At this moment in time, we have something called release under investigation. COVID has identified, well, if you are, it's certainly in my area, Greater Manchester Police, if you are arrested during the COVID period and you are not being remanded into custody, you are not being charged with a criminal offence. So there are some major issues regarding court sittings, how we get these cases through um, the courts and how those are dealt with, which brings in probation, the probation service. But one of the things that I've noticed since I was a legal aid lawyer is literally the amount of work, the amount of work was, was, uh, has been cut in half for various reasons. So a lot of the reduction in the legal aid fees that I received came from the fact that I wasn't representing as many people. When I started off, I was representing, not that this is a, anything to be proud of, but I was representing 10 or 15 defendants at least per day. There were lots of people shoplifting and what we consider minor offences now. But they were legal aid orders were granted for each offence. Those offences are now no longer seen before the court. So I think there's a real issue of justice about the flow of work. I think if the flow of work is dealt with by everyone involved in the criminal justice system in an appropriate way, that will create more, I hate to put it in these terms from a legal perspective, but more fee income, which will encourage more people into the profession and give a more sustainable income. I agree with the panelists that, uh, as I've said already, that I think that legal aid budgets should be increased, but they have to be targeted in a way that, ha that um, allows lawyers to make a sustainable living. I, for many years, worked in a practice where we had a legal aid family practitioner. We no longer have a legal aid fam family practitioner. It's quite clearly correct that some of the areas where legal aid is no longer available, that they should be available. You cannot, uh, if we're talking about immigration and other matters such as that, which involve um, the most basic civil liberties, then people should have access to a lawyer and well for the, the ability to pay for that should not, um, should not be a bar to that. And I'm very, during my time in this parliament and on the Justice Select Committee, I will be arguing very strongly for that. And for, I always feel that the role lawyers are, uh, as, you, as somebody said here, we're viewed as, even if you're a legal aid lawyer, sort of some fat cat, rich, out of touch person. Whereas I have represented in Berry generations of family. I have gone in every single day into a court, which I'm sure Carl has as well and other lawyers, asking for people 10 times a day to be rehabilitated. I know, uh, as I walk down the main street in Berry, I know generations of people who have suffered from the same underlying social um, issues and, and, and all, all sorts of matters. And I think legal aid lawyers should look that perhaps one of the real positives uh, about being a legal aid lawyer, whether it's in family or anything else, is the ability to change people's lives, to be there on what I would call the shop floor, to be there knowing how people are living their lives, understanding what it is that uh, the social problems in society. And actually, we are lucky to be one of the few professions who can really fight um, for just uh, and, um, and proper outcomes for some of the poorest and most disadvantaged in our, in our society. So I would encourage everybody into a career in the law, I think the, law, the, the, uh, the legal aid system is not sustainable going forward. We have to find a way where young lawyers, um, in the, certainly solicitors, can be encouraged perhaps to set their own firms, to join together, to be ambitious and perhaps to, uh, Megan, I, I don't know what the answer is, but there has to be, we have to take this debate forward and find answers to make sure that the people who are going through the universities at this moment in time have the careers that they have, you produce the young lawyers, we have the money in the system to support them, and justice will be delivered to the most disadvantaged who need that. So that's my experience. I've had a fulfilling, fantastic career. I think I was, probably Cole will know what I'm talking about when I'm saying this. I think I was a legal aid lawyer during the best of, during a, a better period, shall we say, both from a, 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 a career perspective, but also, I think in many ways, from a justice perspective, if I can put that, and if we, if we talked about the justice perspective, we'd be here all night, so I don't want to go on, it, on any further. But there's much to do, and I think, hopefully, that this will be a cross-party campaign or cross-party together for four years to try and make sure that those who need the help get the help. Thank you very much, James. Thank you to everyone for their introductions and all the work that they've been doing. So now we're just going to have a look to see what questions have been asked. Uh, so the first one for the panel is, 
Do the speakers support a statutory right to justice as recommended by the BAC Commission on Access to Justice, so i.e. a new statutory right to reasonable legal assistance that people can afford? A resounding yes from everyone. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, and indeed, Jim. Megan, it made its way into the previous, the, the 2019 Labour Party manifesto. Bark Commission actually was something that I was instrumental in setting up. And I think that particular su suggestion came from Charlie Faulkner, who was previously a Lord Chancellor under the Labour government. It's absolutely essential. We have to treat uh, access to justice in the same way as other areas of the welfare state, and I'm afraid, sadly, under uh, governments of uh, all political persuasions, uh, that has failed in recent years. Great. And if I, I can just come in on that. I mean, I think I'm very much involved in the campaign for a universal basic income, and alongside that is the idea of universal services. And we really, you know, and I think COVID is an enormous opportunity to really talk about this because so many people are falling through the gaps. And it's obvious we're in an age of shocks and a really difficult time and people need a safety net. And, you know, those universal services should include legal services, they should include housing. You know, there needs to be a complete net of safety there. Um, and that security will make, you know, all of us safer and have a much better society with much better levels of well-being. It, sorry to interrupt. If you are... Society exists on the basis, uh, this sounds a ridiculous comment to make, but we, we have fantastic education system, we have fantastic doctors, but unless you have rules, a justice system on which you grant people rights, we don't really live in any type of civilized society. Now, giving people rights is one thing and statute, but unless you as an individual have the right to challenge them, enforce them, to do something with those rights, those rights don't mean anything. We, we don't live in a, shall I say, a well, we don't, we don't live in, in a rights-based society. So the only way that those r rules that w all the politicians sat here make in this place, mm -hmm. the only way they matter and impact on people's lives is if they can be challenged. And you can't cut people out from challenging them because they've got no income. Because it's almost certainly the case that the people with no income are the people who need those rights most of all. So that's why I think I agree with what the speakers have said. Megan, can I just add something? Um, I've driven from Parliament today. I got in a, a few minutes before this begun. And on the drive, I was really rather looking forward to having a good old scrap with James. <laughs> and I'm incredibly disappointed that everything he's said up to now, I agree with virtually entirely. So it's disappointed, but there we are. <laughs> Um, so the next question that we have on here is can, so we've got uh, one of the attendees is from Wales, can Liz explain a bit more about what she wants means about devolution of the legal system in Wales and how she envisages that will work? Okay. Well, what we've got um, is what um, John Thomas describes as the, the jagged edge of devolution. So for example, you've got Kafkas answering to Welsh Government um, you've got the legislation that I was talking about, violence against women and girls uh, legislation, 2015 in Wales, um, sitting alongside the domestic abuse legislation. And quite interesting, actually, when you, you raise certain points of that here in Westminster with, with MOJ, is suddenly they just literally don't know about it. They don't know that it exists. They don't know how it is applied. And um, very interesting what you're seeing, because Welsh Government and the Senedd are doing their best to know if they've got importance to them. There are three things that are happening, really. Probably the least significant, but nonetheless, the least significant of the larger term, but nonetheless it's worth pointing out, is you've got a duplication of bodies and authorities talking about very similar things. So you'll have bodies set up by the MOJ and the Home Office in Wales, as you would have in England, but you'll also have bodies and, 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 and panels and committees set up by Welsh Government to discuss. Right? And so you've got these actually a duplication there. Then you've got the fact that public money is being used in Wales for very similar purposes. I mean, Welsh Government, for example, funds many um, PCSOs within the police force. That actually means that we have a better presence from the police. But nonetheless, Welsh Government has chosen to make the strategy with which I agree 
to make up for the, last, the lack of police officers who would otherwise be, be present. They, they, they are putting into effect certain policies because we can't put pressure, you know, we have no way of, 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 of enabling that through Westminster. And thirdly, you've got actually a sense of confusion about what people's rights are and which legislation applies where. Now, I know the Law Society is somewhat concerned about this, the, the increase in, in legislation in Wales. But to speak very frankly, we have a legislature, it will legislate, there will be more legislation in the future. And I think the Law Society may well be you know, keen on the idea of being able to operate in different jurisdictions, but I really speak me, and I may be speaking plainly here and I may be shot down, but I think that is within the ability of, of lawyers to, to deal with different systems in, in different places. And very interestingly, to come back to this report from October 2019, what it sets out is what could improve the experience for the citizen, which is what this comes down to in the end. This isn't a matter of just talking about different committees or, or different professionals. To improve the experience of the citizen in the here and now, and looking into the future where this, this is going to drive, you're going to get more of legislation, as I said earlier. What should be undertaken to improve this in the medium term? And then in the longer term, and of course this, this was a commission that was set up by Welsh Government, it does recommend a separate jurisdiction for Wales. So how do we work towards that in a way that is meaningful? Just to come back to the confusion for the citizen, of course you can see this in action at the moment with the COVID-19 regulations. You've got, you're not expected to go beyond five miles for your social or exercise activities in Wales. Um, we, we still haven't reopened. We're not talking about reopening our, our zoos. We're not we're talking about you know, certain activities. We've been having to deal with people and the police have been having to deal with people who think that you can just come and walk up Snowdon again. And of course the national parks are all shut. So actually the, the reality of the border, which will always be porous because the way it's set between England and Wales, but the reality of the border has actually been brought into sharp definition by COVID, just as we're discussing this in the more abstract law. Great, thank you, Liz. And I also just want to let everyone know that we that uh, YLL has a virtual meeting coming up on access to justice and legal aid advice and um, legal advice deserts in Wales, which is happening in two weeks. So that might be of interest to some of the people attending. Um, so the next question is a question for James Daly MP. Can you please explain the purpose? of saying stuffed with barristers, it isn't the bar that has cut funds to legal aid, the criminal bar is dying off. We too are not fat cats and the lack of diversity at the bar clearly demonstrates that the poor fees, the ridiculous hours and the cuts and cuts are the reasons for that. Um, I don't make any apology for saying that I think that the solicitor profession has not been, had the same level of as power of voice within Westminster as the bar. Um, and that, that is my experience. That one of the things why I want to come here is to say that the, you know, the, I tried to make the case after 16 years of going into police stations, I want to try and be part of a process that creates a sustainable career for the people who are, who are, at the, who, who are carrying out a certain very important function within the, um, within the uh, within the justice system, as I say, I'm not making any comment, but I think that historically um, there have been more people from the a background of a bar of the, of the the barrister background who come to Parliament than than solicitor. I might be wrong on that, but that's my feeling about this. And I feel that the bar that the bar historically have been better at championing their interest, which is exactly what they should be doing, and they're doing a very good job in respect of that. Uh, and I just feel that um, the solicitors, solicitors and legal aid solicitors in particular should have as strong and as powerful voice and be as effective as the bar. The bar are going through, especially the junior bar, are going through a very, very difficult time. Uh, and I fully uh, recognise that uh, and support that. But I get back to that point that I said, that, that uh, if, you were to, if we were to have, a, uh, should we say, an open debate regarding incomes, if you are a criminal legal aid solicitor, and you do not own your own firm, you are, during the course of your career, likely to earn a lot less, this is based upon times gone past, 
than somebody who is at the criminal bar. And I don't, that's not a problem. That's no issue. I'm, I'm, I want them to earn good and positive and, sus and sustainable livings. But it just comes back down to that. I believe that criminal legal aid, sorry, legal aid lawyers in particular need a strong voice and need to defend their interests better. And there's not many of us in the house. It's just a fact, you know. Thank you very much, James. And I think that Daisy, you would typed a, an answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it so you can answer it live. Um, at Suffolk Law Centre during lockdown, we are getting a lot of call for legal help, which is out of scope, such as being made to work in unsafe workplaces or loss of child contact during lockdown. As this need is unfunded, this limits our ability to respond. What can be done to make legal help and legal aid much more flexible and responsive to the urgent need for urgent initial legal help due to specific crisis? Sure. So um, changing the scope of legislation is a pretty big thing to do. The only sort of tiny silver lining, if I can call it that, of the COVID crisis is that these emergency powers mean that where there's political will, things can change overnight, literally, <laughs> in terms of government policy. Um, this is the first time if I'm honest, that anybody's raised with me. Um, I think that if the Legal Aid Network could pull together some examples of the kind of things that are particularly necessary right now, um, in terms of things that are normally out of scope, but could be regarded as being in scope because it's suddenly come into focus as a result of the COVID restrictions, um, then I'm sure that some of us on this call might be willing to do some kind of cross-party letter or something to ask the Justice Secretary of State to actually consider um, some flexibility around what is and isn't out of scope um, in terms of providing funding for that. And as I say, I think the, I mean, the Legal Aid Practitioners Group has already suggested this idea of a grant-based crisis fund, but that is to support, that's to support work that is already within scope. Nobody has raised this question of, what is, you know, of what, what's out of scope that could be brought within scope for a certain period of time, maybe for as long as the um, emergency uh, regulations are in place. But certainly if Audrey and others can pull together some examples and send them to us, then I'm sure we can certainly look at a letter and see if we'd be prepared to sign it together. Yeah, I think that's definitely something we can have a look at. And, um, and I think if I can just, just add in on that, I mean, the actual, um, that emergency coronavirus legislation that Daisy was referring to, I think there's going to be, there already has been, and there will be a lot more really disturbing cases of misuse uh, ill use, not always ill intention, but just police not really knowing what they're doing. And, you know, the, the, the confusion between what the law is and what the government might have said today has been very large. And there was a horrendous case up here in Yorkshire at York Station, where there was a woman who was arrested and jailed. This is, case has subsequently been unwoven because news came out about how horrendous it was. But it turned out that basically she was arrested for being on the station for no good reason. Um, there was actually no legal basis for this anyway. Um, and she was actually sent to jail, having not spoken one word to any person and unrepresented. Now, I don't, can't fully unpick everything that went wrong there, but I fear that, that under the emergency legislation in particular, there might be an awful lot of things going very horribly wrong. And, you know, I will mention very quickly the words, do, the name Dominic Cummings. If you know the right things to say, if you're stopped by a police officer, basically you're fine. If you don't know the right things to say, if you're, you know, say a young Roma man here in Sheffield, and you don't know the formula you're supposed to recite when the policeman says, why are you out of your house? Um, you know, there's really huge inequities in the way this is being policed and the way the law is set out and some really big problems with the scope of, of the emergency legislation. Thank you. Can I just say something? that I'm, um, I'm old enough, and I suspect, although he looks far younger than me, that Carl is probably old enough to remember the green form system and the, and the, the, the nodding head. Now, I don't know whether young lawyers will remember what, what, know on earth what I'm talking about in terms of green form, but basically... The green form system was a was a should we say a fixed payment that allowed lawyers to bring uh, clients into the office for initial advice and to give uh, advice on 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 in what well, I suppose you could say uh, emergency. But it was the first step on the legal process, and lawyers were paid separately on what on these green forms. And I remember having piles of the things because people used to come in and take advantage of that advice and be given at least a start in terms of knowing their rights and knowing where to turn to uh, and things like that. And I think that one of the things we should look at is the reintroduction of a, of a green form type of scheme across the legal aid system 
which is a payment that lawyers can receive for initial emergency advice, however you want to describe it, of people coming in to see them that can help and assist and obviously hopefully lead on to further representation or whatever, however it could go. So I, I think that was a good system in the past and I think a version of it can be, um, we can get hopefully a version of that can be, uh, can come back. That's really interesting, thank you. We're very happy uh, to work on it with you. <laughs> Uh, Shadow Justice Secretary David Lammy has tabled a prayer against the statutory instrument that introduces a new £627 asylum fixed fee. Can Carl Turner update us regarding this? Sorry, Carl, you're on mute, mute still. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think we've got about 50 members of Parliament who've signed it now. Can I just start by saying thank you to young legal aid lawyers actually, for pointing the issue out to me, um, because the reality was it was something that I'd not spotted. You brought it to my attention and without you, frankly, we wouldn't have had an opportunity to try and uh, do something about it. But it effectively, you know, it's just a completely cynical ploy. The just, I raised it at justice questions yesterday, the justice secretary, you know, seemed incredibly, angry at the thought that I would make mention of it. Um, but actually, what it's, what, what it's planned to do is to cut fees. That's the reality of it. There's no question about it. it you know, for all intents and purposes, it appears to increase the fixed fee, but actually it has the opposite effect because you never get into the hourly rate until you get to the escape fee you're never going to get into 1881 quid or whatever it is so actually you're going to be doing everything all of the work for that uh, fixed fee you know lawyers are going to just walk away in my view and that's you know we must absolutely prevent that happening and the next question is, James Daly, totally agree that migrants deserve access to legal aid. Will you support YLL's A Prayer for Legal Aid fatal motion to the new fixed fees that threaten sustainability of legal aid firms? That's what Carl's just been talking about, the same thing. Um, I, I speak, as I said, I, hopefully I've been honest enough to say to you that I have a criminal legal aid background, and that's mm -hmm. where my, um, my expertise, I share a commitment to access to justice, I have to be honest that I, I wouldn't want to give you an answer to that question without the knowledge to have looked. If, if you can provide me with, if we can discuss this afterwards, I don't want to say something which I, I don't, I, I haven't, it's something that, that um, I think is very important. Uh, and if um, we could talk about that further going forward, I'd be very, very grateful. But I don't have the knowledge or experience to give you an informed answer in respect to that. So I do apologise to you for that, but that's the honest response. No, I'm, we're happy to send you through our briefing, uh, which sets out the issue. So the next question. Our recession seems likely to be on the horizon due to the impact of coronavirus and lockdown in the economy. How do we ensure that we recession-proof access to justice so that if a return to austerity is deemed necessary, we don't see a repeat of last vote and further cuts to legal aid in the future? So I guess that's open to the, the panel. Can, can I, I'm sorry for, for dominating this and I'm being very, can I just say something about, I just want to get back to this issue about work in the, and I'm talking the criminal legal aid sense. Now that this, this is just a general comment. Prior, prior to the COVID, the, the COVID situation, we created a scenario in the criminal courts whereby many areas had up to a thousand, perhaps over a thousand people on release under investigation for the most, sometimes for the most serious offences, which um, that release under investigation would, would sometimes go on for 12, 18 months and longer than that. As I commented at the start of this, we now have a situation where people are not being put in front of the court and the, 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 the build up of that is going to be pretty huge for the court system. So I just wanted to make the, the point that in terms of creating extra income in the system you know justice has to be served these have to be cases that are considered by the crown prosecution service but there is much work out there which is not getting into the system 
to allow criminal legal, legal aid lawyers to do their job. Now, hopefully, all of those hundreds upon hundreds of people may well, you know, there may not be the evidence there, but there is a lot of work there which we need to ensure in all sense of the, of the word justice and the system that that is that goes through the system at the earliest opportunity and that will produce in its most basic economic form an income stream for lawyers and i just think that's an important part of this debate and it's something that we need to sort out release under investigation needs to be sorted out people are committing offenses at this moment in time I got, I got told, Megan, by a, a, and I could tell you many stories like this, police station a couple of weeks ago, somebody punches a police officer in the face, four police officers around them, on video, and he released under investigation, no charge, nothing. My only point in respect to that is not trying to highlight, uh, you know, an extreme case, but there is, there are acts there that require people to go through the criminal justice system, which will produce more work and more income. But I agree that I think the other panelists will say we've got to increase fees. I agree with that as well. I would do as a lawyer, but there's, there's a number of a number of sides to this to make sure that we have sustainable incomes. Can Thank I you. just, off the back of what James has just said, look, he's right, absolutely, he's right. But what's not been spoken about, what the government ministers, what Alex Chalk and what the Lord Chancellor are not prepared to uh, look at is the fact that criminal solicitors are doing an incredible amount of work for free as a result of release under investigation. If somebody gets the collar fell and he's dragged into the police station and then he's released under investigation, it doesn't stop for the solicitor at that point. It might stop temporarily for the police investigation, but the solicitor re receives phone calls, the solicitor has to chase where items of equipment billing. might be. 